You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Challenge us at Wexford Insurances, 0818 31 30 30. I'm joined now in studio by David McLaughlin, CEO of Wexford Festival Opera. David, you might start by telling me a bit about your own background, please. Sure. Well, I suppose in a way my, my background could be seen by some at least to be somewhat interesting, purely on the basis of my background isn't actually from opera itself. And I think some people are surprised to hear that somebody who is the chief executive of an opera festival and opera house didn't actually have a specific background in opera. But I suppose I came from, as you can probably tell from my accent, came from Dublin originally, where I worked for many years, graduated from Trinity College with an economics degree. Uh, and actually, the sector I worked in for many years, for close to 15 years, was actually in the film industry, uh, working both directly in film production. I had a production company myself for a number of years, and I also worked for a number of the larger production companies prior to that as head of production. And also prior to that, I was actually chief executive of the then Dublin Film Festival for five years back in the 90s. Um, and I then moved from that to running as chief executive the main employers organization or representative organization for the film, television, animation sector in Ireland, which was an IBEC affiliated organization. Um, so my background from that point of view, I say, was predominantly in the film production area and also with experience in festivals, particularly film festivals. So in a way, when this opportunity arose back in 2007 and I was asked would I be interested in sort of throwing my hat in the ring, it was an interesting prospect, even though I was the first to admit that I didn't actually have a huge knowledge of or certainly didn't have an expertise in opera from a production point of view. But I think what was of interest to the festival uh, was the fact that I did certainly have experience um, in terms of festivals to start off with, but certainly and but also added to that was in terms of production, albeit film production. And in many ways, there are quite a lot of parallels between the film art form and the opera art form. At the end of the day, there's a lot of production um, similarities in many ways to that as well. So um, I came down here in 2007. Um, I was interim chief executive for six months, and then I went put my sort of hat in the ring for the sort of longer term position, and I was fortunate then to be appointed to that particular role. Um, and at this stage, I'm sort of here over five and a half years at this point. And has the current economic climate had an adverse effect on ticket sales for the festival? Oh, definitely. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it's the one good thing about Wexford is that it has a very loyal audience and also it has an extremely strong brand name in the market, not just locally, but also nationally and indeed internationally. So from that point of view, you know, the fact that so many people spend so much time uh, working on and building up Wexford for so many years, right from 1951 onwards, has meant to a certain extent that the festival has been somewhat more resilient than a lot of other arts and cultural organisations, particularly more recently formed ones, would have been. But if you look at the arts sector and cultural sector in Ireland, and in fact internationally, virtually every art form has been affected by the recession in terms of audiences. And again, it simply is indicative of the fact that uh, consumers, irrespective of what products they're buying or what market they're in, are being far more reticent in terms of spending their money. And we're finding that very much in the arts. We're finding that people are... A, spending less, but B, their consumer and patterns and their purchasing decisions are being made far more at the last minute. Have ticket prices been reduced this year? They have. What we've done with ticket prices, and again, we've looked at all of our ticket pricing. Um, You have to bear in mind with opera as well, it is by far the most expensive performance art form to produce. So again, I think people have to realise that, uh, that, and added to that, that the level of public subsidy for opera in Ireland is actually very small. I know a lot of people say, look, you get a lot of money from the state, but in proportion to what similar organisations get in not just in sort of continental Europe, but if you look at even Eastern Europe and economies, which are actually in a much worse situation, aren't the level of public subsidy as a proportion of income is actually much higher. But taking that into account, what we have done is we've looked at all of our pricing right across the board and we have reduced uh, prices uh, for different events, um, depending on obviously the particular nights that are on, depending on the all the various sort of facts we put in. So we've introduced a situation whereby, depending on what night people want to book a ticket and depending where they want to sit within the opera house itself, there's a whole variety of different prices. So again, we've also introduced as well initiatives in terms of introducing special prices for our sort of newer audience or younger audiences, which we would classify as people who are 35 or younger. What can people expect from the festival this year? Well, I think this year's festival should be a very good one. We're certainly very optimistic about it, and certainly the kind of the from watching the rehearsals over the last few weeks, which have been going on here since mid-September, certainly there's a great buzz, and there seems to be a great uh, feeling of anticipation that this year should be a really 
good festival. Three large main stage productions. We have an Italian, we have a French, and we have an English opera this year. Again, they're all very different in many ways, and they'll appeal to different audiences and, and different audiences' emotions in many, in many ways. But I think people will be... Uh, I think intrigued certainly by by what is there, and the one thing I can certainly guarantee is that the quality will be as good as ever. I mean, just you know, we we obviously focus on excellence, and there's no doubt about it. I think I think everyone in Wexford, and I think you know, uh, I think Ireland itself should be very proud of the fact that from an international point of view, we produce here in Wexford uh, something which is absolutely of the highest international standard from a from a production point of view. James O'Connor from Green Acres joined me on the show recently and he honestly said that he wouldn't have a business only for the Opera Festival. Can you quantify the benefits which the festival brings to County Wexford in relation to income generation and employment? I think what some people don't often fully recognise the fact that you know the festival is not simply a cultural and artistic event and albeit quite a successful one and one that you know brings a lot of attention to Wexford but it's also a huge uh, economic and financial event as well in many senses. If you take into fact, you know, we are spending as in the festival approximately four million per year. But to give you a few examples of in terms of the actual spend, you know, we will be spending directly as in the festival itself, we'll be spending this year about 120,000 euro directly on renting local properties for the artistic company, which is the artists, the the conductors, the, the various kind of technical people and so on. That. So that's a direct injection we make directly into the economy. That's before you take into account the fact that, you know, for the two months of the year, the festival itself is employing about 250 people for two months a year, um, which again, it means that for this particular period of the year, we're one of the largest employers in the town, and you could even say for the county as well. Added to that, apart from the fact that we're, you know, we're one of the largest employers in town for that particular time of the year and for that particular period, you have to bear in mind the number of people that we're attracting to the town and to the county in terms of the fact that we're attracting 20,000 ticket holders, and that's specifically for Wexford festival opera events that before you take into account people that are also coming for fringe events and the various other events that happen throughout the town uh, all in one way or another linked to the festival itself and that's a huge amount of spend as well because you're talking about people again 25% of our audience are coming from the UK these are people who are spending money on accommodation they're spending money on uh, entertainment they're spending money on food and drink etc so we conducted uh, some research back in 2009 which was done uh, with the facilitation of Fulch Ireland who are one of our supporters and they got the independent research organisation Amoric Research to do research amongst our, our customers that year and so on and they estimated that the spend which was directly generated by the festival was in around 7.5 million now again, I know people bandy across figures in various ways, and in many ways I often kind of really more rely specifically on the figures I know for definite in terms of what we spend. And I think if you take into account what we spend and then put in what is considered to be the, the reasonable multiplier effect, you're talking about an economic generation directly within the local area of certainly between 7.5 and, and 10 million per year. David, I'm sure there have been challenges in organising this festival. What was the major challenge and what did you do to overcome it? Yeah, I suppose with any business, there's always challenges, uh, some big, some small, uh, some which are easy to solve fairly quickly and others which are more long term by nature and take more strategic planning to deal with. Um, I suppose the challenge which we always have, and I think an awful lot of other business people out there would very much uh, appreciate this and, and, and uh, agree with this, is predominantly a financial one. Um, we have a situation whereby... I'd say the festival as an organization we need to generate roughly four million per year um and that's in this in an environment whereby our traditional forms of funding which are predominantly or have been in the past public funding and box office one of which is receding and the other one is at best static it may start increasing the number of years but either way that's a challenge in itself so therefore I suppose the key challenge, and this has been over a number of years, but is an increasing challenge, but I think we're also managing to kind of step up to the plate increasingly as well to deal with it, has been how do we sort of fill that gap and how do we not only maintain our budgets, but also uh, attract additional funding to provide further funding for what we want to do in terms of the festival stuff, but also other plans we have in terms of expanding our range of activities and so on. Um, and I think the other challenge linked to that is planning. And from an artistic point of view, um, we, if you look at similar organisations around the world, uh, large opera festivals, large opera houses, etc., they would tend to plan on a three to five year basis. In other words, they'd be able to say, well, look, we have our programme mapped out for the next three to five years. And in many cases, internationally, they often haven't funded for the next three to five years. We operate in an environment where we unfortunately only work on a single year funding basis. In other words, our funding, for example, from the Arts Council, our box office funding, it's only on a, an annual basis. We only know 
within the financial year exactly what our funding is going to be from those two sources. And that's often the case as well in terms of our commercial funding, sponsorship and so on. So we need to move to a, a situation whereby not only is our level of funding increasing, not only are we diversifying the sources of funding, but also we're getting to a, a situation whereby we're moving far more towards multi-annual funding rather than single annual funding. Because it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, and maybe it's made it fairly elementary, but certainly I think it's worth saying that if we can get to a point whereby we can know three years in advance what our main productors are going to be, it has two major advantages. One is obviously it means that we can far more economic in terms of how we produce those operas because we can buy in advance, we can do deals in advance rather than trying to do that within the year of the production itself. But secondly, what we can do is we can attract not just audiences and interest audiences in events we have in two or three years' time, but more importantly, what we can do is we can try and attract increased amounts of funding from both commercial funders, but more importantly, from philanthropic donors. Because if you're trying to set out a stall, uh, particularly amongst uh, potential donors, and this is very much the case, for example, in the United States, which we've had recent experience of, if you can say to them, look, this, these are our plans for the next three years, and for example, we are planning particular productions in 2015, you're going to find a situation that the donors are, first, we're going to form more confidence in you because you're showing much more ambition for the future. But also, you'd be amazed where people say, actually, this year, the production you have, they're interesting, but they're not quite my cup of tea. But you have that thing coming up in 2015. I really like that. And because you're doing that in 2015, I'm going to give you some money now. So in other words, it makes sense even from a current cash flow point of view to be able to say what you're doing in three years' time, even though the cost may not actually be for three years' time, which you have to meet. So that's part of the challenge as well. It's about expanding our planning horizon. It's about uh, diversifying and differentiating our income sources and overall increasing our income. David, that's certainly a very interesting concept, uh, that whole area of philanthropy. Now, how do you identify these philanthropists? And secondly, why do they decide to donate to Exford Festival Opera? Sure. And just for an answer, I might just put it a little bit into context. Uh, it's been estimated that the total level of philanthropy in Ireland, in other words, the total amount of donations to not-for-profit organisations, including cultural ones, including Max Festival Trust, is about €500 million Euro per year. Now, again, a lot of people might say that's quite a lot, but bear in mind, in the UK, it's €14 billion per year, and in the US, it's €265 billion per year, which is contributed by true philanthropy. So that just puts it in context in terms of the fact that, okay, it's it's big, but it's not as anywhere as big as it could be. And also, if you bear in mind that of that 500 million a year, only about 0.6%, which is about 3 million euro, is actually raised by our arts organisations. That would be ourselves, various other arts organisations all around the country. So there's an ambition, which, for example, the Arts Council have in particular, and also the Department of Arts as well, who are taking quite a strong interest in philanthropy in terms of cultural organisations, is, is to increase that 0.6% up to 5%. In other words, they want arts organisations to, instead of only getting 3 million per year out of that, overall 500 million to increase about 25 million and there's also this form in philanthropy which uh, Minister Hogan has been involved in setting up with the overall aim that the level of giving in Ireland will increase from 500 million to 800 million so in other words it's interesting what's going on in the market in terms of what's happening and we're trying to very much play a part in that if you look at Wexford Festival Trust um, we in the last year or so have very much uh, and this is at from board level at executive level and right through the organization we've really put a, a serious priority on fundraising and development in, in the overall sense and the reason for that is obviously one because we're in a situation whereby we do need to as i mentioned earlier on look at new sources of income and diversify our, our overall income sources but secondly i think it's worth bearing in mind there's great potential there for wex festival trust i find that when i do go abroad particularly in the states and the uk and um, what a lot of people don't i think fully realize and often including myself and i think a lot of other people associated with the organization is the amazing reputation that Wexford Festival has internationally and that's not just amongst opera lovers it's really the fact that uh, an organization which has maintained such a level of excellence and such a strong community spirit over 61 years is recognized internationally um, and that is very much the case so there's an awful lot of goodwill towards Ireland generally but there's also an awful lot of goodwill towards culture in Ireland and in particular towards Wexford. Now one of the few criticisms that have been leveled at the opera festival is that it only appeals to a specific clientele do you think there's an opportunity to make the festival more appealing to the general public? Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think that's a little bit of a myth. And the reason I say that is, and it goes back to what I mentioned around the beginning about my background being not from opera. Uh, and the first time I actually attended the festival was in 2007. So uh, in many ways, I was kind of experiencing the festival um, in many ways uh, for the first time. 
But I've noticed, and part of my duties, which I actually really enjoy, is that every night I'm there at the door with, with the chairman and the artistic director to welcome all the patrons in and there every night say goodbye to them and listen to their comments. But I've always been struck every year by being there. And, and these are for the, the main stage operas, so the operas where you know the dress code is advisory, at least, is black tie and so on. So it's, it's, it's the nights where most of the opera buffs you could say you go to, and they're the nights where people make the after dress up. But I'm amazed by the cross-section of people who come along. You have people from all backgrounds, you have people young and old. And I think the traditional view, and in many ways maybe such this stereotypical view, is that the opera festival audience is predominantly individuals in their late 40s or beyond, predominantly from a particular social class or particular income class. So on. And it's not actually not quite the case. It's actually far more uh, diversified than people would actually expect. Now, that said, there's no doubt about it that opera is seen nationally and internationally as being, to a certain extent, a slightly uh, elitist art form. And what I say about that is that it's an art form that obviously has a particular specialist audience in itself, in the same way ballet would be the same and various other art forms. And also, uh, some people would feel the cost of tickets somehow can be prohibitive. And I've mentioned earlier on that, you know, we're doing as much as we can in terms of trying to subsidize tickets, particularly for younger audiences. And as I said, there's a reason why the tickets are the price which they are, which has got to the, the, the cost of what we put on stage and the fact that public subsidy is what it, what it could be or should be. But I think it's, um, it's interesting to say that, and I think one of the great things about Wexford is that it's not just an opera festival and a, a great producer of opera, but it is a community event. It's an event that was actually started by the community, as you well know, it was founded by the community, it has remained in the community, and in many ways, the community is the backbone of it. So that in itself creates a huge loyal audience, people who are the, you know, the, the sons and daughters, or even the grandsons and the granddaughters of the original founders are all huge supporters, both, both between them being vo- part of the fantastic volunteer corps, but also people that actually buy tickets for the festival as well. So I think it's one of these things that, yeah, we, I certainly have a challenge without a doubt as all arts organizations do in terms of an audience succession policy because obviously we need to make sure that as the current audience as a group you know begin to move on we need to make sure there's new world audience coming in the whole time but i think in many ways i think people would be surprised but actually it's a very broad section come already to the festival and does the opera festival present any opportunities for the opera house to develop business or strategic relationships with international businesses or agencies what frequently happens and increasingly is happening is is that uh Opera companies and opera houses from around the world, from Europe, from the States, from various other places, they come to Wexford, they see Wexford's productions and they basically buy them from us. So there's, there's an increasing market in terms of actually buying the Wexford productions and then they go to different places. For example, Mario, which was the um, Polish opera last year, that's going to Krakow. Uh, we also had Hubichka, which was a production in 2010, that's that's going to St. Louis um, next summer. Um, so. And we're, we're, that's one thing that uh, David and his colleagues have been increasingly successful at doing in terms of uh, expanding the international market for the products which are originally or first seen here in Wexford. Um, and when you talk about the house, there's no doubt about it that the house itself has been you know, a huge asset for the festival in so many ways, apart from the fact from a production point of view and technical point of view, um, it's been a huge asset. Equally from an audience point of view, I think everyone would feel from a patron comfort point of view, obviously it's been a huge improvement of what would have been there before. But also... Uh, the great thing about the house is that it in itself is an attraction for a lot of people in the opera world, opera professionals from all around the world who like to come to Wexford, not only to experience the productions, but to see what is considered by most people to be one of the best small opera houses in the world. Finally, what are your hopes for the future of the festival? I think the festival has great opportunities ahead of it. Uh, I think the one thing about the festival is that what, in terms of um, really exploiting those opportunities, what it really needs to do is really remain loyal to what it has always done and which is really supposed to pursuit of excellence and always uh, staying faithful to its original sort of artistic policy. I think if the festival keeps its eyes on that then I think there's great opportunities in terms of moving forward in terms of doing new and interesting things into the future. First of all I think the the aims I would have certainly in terms of going forward is to go back to what I mentioned earlier on about um, um, sourcing new income streams which will be more secure, will help us move forward and so on and that. Uh, obviously, I think the more income we can bring into the organisation means that the artistic product can be further enhanced. And then there's opportunities in terms of, for example, trying to see, well, look, are there other things which Wexford Festival uh, can do from a producing point of view right throughout the year, not simply during the 12 days in October. There's opportunities there. There's also opportunities which uh, David is also pursuing, which I'm involved in as well, in terms of further international co-productions, international sales. So there's no doubt about it. I think Wexford, after 61 years, has a really, really strong name, not just amongst audiences, but also within the industry internationally and nationally as well. It's great opportunities there. We just need to focus on what we do best and we need to find additional resources to do more of what we do already. 
Well, David, it's been a very insightful interview. I'd like to thank you for coming in to speak to us this morning and I wish you every success with this year's festival. You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Think Wexford Insurances for your business insurance.